Kia ora everyone, Aloise here from Tairawhiti Museum. This is the fourth film in my little video series about some of the sites of significance around Gisborne that relate to our 20th century military history. Today I've come down to the Cenotaph here behind me, a beautiful memorial designed by Edward Armstrong, a Gisborne architect, and unveiled for Anzac Day in 1923. Plans to erect a war memorial in Gisborne began around 1920. In a public meeting, Gresham Black, speaking on behalf of the parents of soldiers who had died, said they wanted something that would last for all time, that generations yet unborn could point to with pride and say, my relatives took part in that great war. A number of possible sites for the new monument were proposed. One of those was the Band Rotunda site, I discussed in my film yesterday, and the other was the creation of a memorial park on Te Tirangi, Kaiti Hill, although this was not followed through because it was thought that as the parents of the soldiers who had died aged, they would be unable to walk up the hill to the monument. In 1921, W.H. Feldon, an experienced sculptor based in Auckland, was appointed to undertake the project. His plan was to work in New Zealand marble, but with the closing of the Nelson quarries, he found he couldn't procure marble at a price that had been set within the contract terms. He was eventually released from his contract. Mr Charles Armstrong, the district engineer, suggested that if the committee were agreeable, he would ask his son Edward, an architect, then about 25 years old, to prepare a design. Corporal Edward William Armstrong completed his early training with Gisborne architects Burr and Murfield before leaving for the war in June 1918 with the 34th reinforcements. He received a £200 New Zealand Expeditionary Force scholarship to study at the Architecture Association in London. While he was working in London, he won the Henry Java Scholarship, the first New Zealander to do so, and it allowed him to attend the British School in Rome for two years. Edward agreed to undertake the project. He wrote to the committee that the design should express a certain simple dignity of feeling and, if possible, avoid all suggestion of the grandiose or heroic. He wrote, it must be felt by everyone that among the soldiers themselves and the relatives of the fallen, the chief sentiments that they would wish expressed are of the simple pride in the dead they have known and a knowledge that their sacrifices have not been in vain. Armstrong visited Carrara and the quarries in the mountains behind the town personally. The stone, he stated in letter to his father, was of good colour, grain and texture and the workmanship careful. He explained that a plaster model of a lion to form a pattern for those at the base of the monument had been prepared. And, he said, it looked a good deal more like a lion than many of the tame pussycats sometimes seen on monuments. The first shipment of marble left Italy on July 12, 1922. From there to Auckland, and then the 50-tonne shipment was transferred by a coastal vessel to Gisborne. The preliminary work with the monument's foundations and the breastwork required along the riverbank was carried out in 1922. The stone for the piling came from the Public Works Department quarry at Nātapa. Owing to the nature of the ground on the esplanade, a very solid foundation for the 250 tonne structure was required. The harbour board undertook to supply the piles and install them. The monument was unveiled on Anzac Day in 1923 and the ceremony was performed by Colonel C.W. Melville, the commander of the Central Military District. Prior to the ceremony at the District Memorial, a parade of military units and civil organisations was held. The City and Salvation Army bands provided the march music, and the line of march was from the Garrison Hall, which I talked about in my first film, via Ormond Road to Rutene Road, along Harris Street and Wainui Road to the Esplanade. In an article in the Poverty Bay Herald that year, they wrote, Some have returned to us broken and shattered, all of them aged and war-worn. For these it must be our life's duty to see that they want for nothing that we can give, who have done so much for us. But for our gallant dead, what can we do? Nothing but keep their memory ever before us. For months now there has been quietly rising in our midst a noble monument of white Carrara marble, designed by one who himself went forth from Gisborne and fought side by side with our gallant dead, who has known what they suffered, and therefore was able to bring to this labour of love the feeling that alone could make it perfect. I'd now like to describe the memorial in Armstrong's own words. The memorial has been designed as a simple pedestal in which the vertical motive is predominant, supporting the figure of a stooping soldier with reversed rifle. 
This pedestal is in turn held by four buttresses at the base which tend to give that strength of security and strength necessary in repose. A stylobate of four steps gives access to the platform encircling the base of the monument on which space in the form of panels is left for the necessary names. The stylobate is strengthened by a low pedestal or block at each corner, supporting a lion in the attitude of rising, symbolic of awakened empire. The monument is to be entirely faced with white Carrara marble on a concrete coil. The total weight of the structure is about 200 tonnes. Armstrong worked in Myanmar, then Burma, for a number of years. In 1928, he won a design competition for the Robert McDougall Art Gallery in Christchurch. He was in private practice until the Second World War. He returned to New Zealand in 1953 and was admitted to the New Zealand Institute of Architects as a fellow. He worked part-time with Glengarry and Coulson of Gisborne and designed the Farm Products Co-op building. The four First World War panels list the names of 575 men from the region who fell during the war. A further four tablets were added after the Second World War and listed another 474 names. The last tablet also lists the names of five men who fell in Malaya, two in Korea, and two in Vietnam. The cenotaph suffered significant structural damage in Gisborne's 2007 earthquake. A decision was made to restore the monument and upgrade the foundations. Specialist restoration, repair and repolishing was also carried out to the marble. The soldier was removed from atop the plinth in 2013 and finally returned to its place on April 10th, 2015, in time for Anzac Day that year.